When it comes to cooking, we all have different ways and methods in which we use to do this. Some people prefer to use gas, stoves, firewood or charcoal. We rarely put into mind the effects that charcoal and firewood have on our environment. Nevertheless, entrepreneurs spring up every day and give solutions that will last in terms of providing firewood free, charcoal free or in worst cases energy saving solutions that will and can minimize the use of charcoal and firewood in the communities. One such entrepreneur is our guest tonight. My name is Jonathan Baker. Uh, I'm founder of a company called Develatech. Uh, Develatech, we design and manufacture uh, GPOs for the uh, domestic and institutional market. Okay, Jonathan, before you started this, what were you doing before? Uh, I started my career actually designing stoves for a carbon credit company. And that's what got me into it, what found my passion and uh, eventually gave me a career. A feasibility study for a business venture you want to get into gives you heads up on what to expect and market needs for your products. I saw a huge gap in the market for a stove that really uh, was designed for the way people cook in Kenya. Um, a lot of the stoves on the market I felt didn't suit the needs of people cooking in the countryside with, with large families. Why did you choose Kenya you know, as a place to come and do business from? I love Kenya to start with. I thought it was a beautiful place. I love the people and the spirit and the freedom here. Um, I also saw uh, a lot of potential for the, this new product that we've introduced. Because 78% of Kenyans still cook on open fires and, and use traditional fuels. So how long did he have this idea that had come to him about getting into this business venture? It was with me for about seven months. And during that time I was trying to come up with a solution to the one main problem that people always came back to me with was that whenever they made ugali, the pot would be slipping around everywhere because it's a very heavy food and you need to put a lot of effort in. So I was trying to come up with a solution where people could use their existing utensils but put it in a stove where um, it would grip pots of different sizes um, securely. And th this wasn't available on the market at the time. So the whole design was stemmed around that. With a wide market range in Kenya to showcase the need and use of these stoves, Jonathan knew which type to take where. We make energy efficient cook stoves. We have a charcoal version, we have a wood burning version, and we do that for domestic and institutional. So we have a whole range of cook stoves. And who is your target clientele? Um, people in Nairobi for our charcoal units, people in the countryside for our wood burning units. We find um, a lot of people inside Nairobi have family in the countryside, so they, they often take them back as gifts for their family. Jonathan explains the raw materials used in the manufacture of his energy saving stoves. Uh, we use galvanized uh, sheet steel, we use uh, different types of insulation, um, and we have, uh, that's the main, the main materials that we use. Taking you back maybe to where you started, uh, what capital did you inject in this kind of business? Uh, I must have put in about $20,000 of my own money to, to start it. And then uh, initially I was trying to outsource the, the research and development of the product. I found it very difficult with, um, trying to find the right people who would give it the enough care and attention that I needed to put into developing this new design. So uh, the little money that I did have, I put into my own manufacturing equipment. And as soon as I did that, I saw a complete turnaround of the company because I was able to make something and test it the same day. Whereas before it would take me months just to get you know, certain uh, parts to test from trying to find people outside to make it for me. Sometimes entrepreneurs who get a chance to be employed in an area they have an interest in gives them an edge when they want to get into it alone. I do 100% of the design work myself and then we do field testing where we take it out to different communities around Kenya. Uh, we get their feedback, we leave, usually leave the stoves with them for a week and then come back with a questionnaire and then that helps us identify what they liked and what they didn't like. If we need to make any design changes then we bring it back and, and start again. Uh, so how many people have you gotten to employ in this venture that you have so far? Uh, so far we have five people that we've employed and uh, we have interns and volunteers coming through all the time as well. 
So we're always trying to teach and train the youth of Kenya to uh, teach them new skills and um, yeah, new design work. Challenges always come and which one does Jonathan face? It's not always easy for a foreigner obviously to work in a, you know, a different land um, but at the same time you know, I've, I've got help along the way. Um, the Kenya Climate Innovation Centre has been very supportive with our company and challenges right now are probably the main thing is sales and distribution. It's finding um, people to work with to help distribute the products out to the people that need it. He worked in Kenya before venturing into business and got acquainted with many organizations, thus giving him an array of people and groups to work with in terms of marketing his products. Uh, so we work with some community um, organizations, we work with some forest uh, uh, development organizations. Um, we also work with independent distributors. Some people just see the opportunity in, in selling our products. Um, so they buy off us and then they sell them as a part-time job. Um, there's, we've also got a distribution network called Mwezi and they're situated in Mombasa outside Naivasha and Kasumu and, and they distribute our products for us. There is a lot of competition. Um, we don't see it as too much of a threat because the market is so big. Um, what we obviously, you know, there's, there might be people that copy our designs, but that's fine. I'd, I'd actually like to work with them, and you know, in the future, and see how we can improve on it together. Um, yes, there's, a, but I think the nature of people that make GCOs is they want to have their own design to cater for the market, which is the same way that I started. Um, and they see something that people need that perhaps you know we've overlooked. So. There's, there's a lot of room for growth in the sector. Jonathan explains the types of stoves they manufacture daily, not forgetting the pricing according to the market range. We have, in each, we have three sizes and in each size we have three models. Um, our design is quite unique because we have a single, a double and a triple burner of each of a single fire source. So uh, it enables people to choose um, based on their budgets and also their cooking requirements. In a day we can make about 20 to 30 depending on the model that we're making at the time. The, the small single starts at 3,000. Um, our best seller is a small double stove which goes for 4,000 and then we have a, a medium size which goes for 5,500 and then an institutional size for schools and hospitals and goes for 50,000. Are they available in the, in the local supermarkets? Yes, they will be from the start of this year. Uh, we've just got our KEB certificate, so now we can sell business to business. First, you need to identify a passion that you have, something that you really love doing. Um, and then once you've got that passion, you know you've got the drive to sort of see through the harder days when it doesn't always go in your favor. And then once you've identified your, your market sector, you need to find like a gap in the market that somebody hasn't done. And obviously, you know, there's a lot of products out there now. So you really have to be quite unique and, and different. I've never really believed in repackaging something old. There's, um, if, there's a lot of ingenuity out there, so people can really find something new and different to, to help solve a problem. An advice to young people watching you right now, and they probably want to get into this kind of a venture, you know, Jua Kali sector, as we call it here. What advice would you tell them? Always keep going. You're, you're going to have hard days. You're also going to have amazing days. When everything comes together, and you make sales, and you, know, you see your product being used, and you see how much it, in, it improves people's lives. And, and that's what it's all about. And what advice can you give to you know, people watching you from abroad and they would like to invest here in Kenya? What should you tell them? If you're looking to come to Kenya for, as an investment opportunity, there is, there is a huge amount of opportunity here. And with the right market, then the right backing and, and right support, I think you can do very well. His future plans are geared to spread to the region. Future plans are to, to grow the company um, where it's sustainable. Um, I'd like to have distant, different distribution avenues all around Kenya. Um, the nature of the product means that it lends itself quite nicely into other East African countries. So we would look at sort of a natural progression into Uganda and Tanzania 
Um, maybe we can get personal here right now. Let's see what you do in your free time. What are your hobbies? Uh, I love exploring Kenya. Uh, it's a beautiful country. There's lots of places to see. Um, the wildlife um, up country around Mount Kenya is really nice, so I go camping up there. Um, throughout the year, there's a bit of uh, surf as well, so I get down to Mombasa. Um, yeah, it's, no, it's, it's a great place. So just being outside is how I like spending my time. If you have any comments on tonight's entrepreneur, leave a comment on our Facebook page, KTN The Entrepreneur, or reach us on our Twitter handle, KTN The Entrepreneur. All at some point as entrepreneurs get ideas of business ventures that we would like to start and get into. Question is, how many actually get to take that step and actualize the idea? Taking that risk and starting ends up paying off, so entrepreneurs need to be on the lookout. And this is what our guest tonight, Becky Ndegwa, did. Let me start with the name Indigo. Mm -hmm. What does it mean and why did you choose that name, Indigo 6? Um, Indigo is a color in the rainbow and uh, it's a color that is not commonly referred to uh, it's something between a purple and a blue and i thought it would stand out because my company the shukas are about color they are very colorful and i wanted a name that defined a, uh, i mean a name that was close to a color and i thought indigo being the sixth color in the rainbow Work 12, so I just named it Indigo 6. While in business, some people get that idea to get into entrepreneurship. As for Becky, when did that idea pop in her mind to step out? In the, in, in the time that I have worked, I have always wanted to have my own business, but I really didn't know what I wanted to do. So let's say for the last nine years, I've wanted to do a business, but I didn't quite know what business. Whatever you keep thinking as a business idea could become big, so don't take lightly what thoughts cross your mind. This came to me accidentally, is what I can say. It's not something that I had planned or thought about. I've always been interested in interior design, but not necessarily um, the painting and the, and the curtains and stuff. Uh, but I've always wanted like a colorful home. Um, so one time, uh, last July actually, when I was uh, around Father's Day and I was thinking of um, what to get my husband for a uh, Father's Day gift. As it is, you know how difficult it is to get a man a gift. I was sitting with this Masai Shuka which uh, basically didn't have anything on it and it was very cold. I live in Athiriva so when I say it's cold, it was really, really cold. Um, and I was sitting on the couch and I asked for the Masai Shuka which is it doesn't even have a nice feel, but it has good colors. So I sat with it and um, it wasn't warm. So I asked for a, a small fleece blanket and I put it together. And um, when I put it together, I thought we could sew this together so that it just becomes one nice colorful blanket. And the Father's Day gift for her husband was created just by an idea. I went to town and I bought um, a shuka, one shuka and a piece of fleece from River Road and I got them stitched by my mom-in-law and I gave that as a, um, a gift to my husband which he thought was really nice and very creative. Some entrepreneurs know that one person knows another and the chain gets longer. Becky identified a link that would generate a long-term business for her. I didn't know her very well then. She's Caroline Mutoko. So I gifted her. A blanket and um, she was very 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 impressed and after that she ordered a couple so I didn't know where to start I went back to the shop and I bought a few more fleeces and a few more shokas and I stitched them and after that she just kept asking because people kept asking she would give a gift and somebody else would give a gift so I'd say indigo really started with Caroline Mutoko 
she's the one who ordered from me and ordered in large masses. Big dreams don't necessarily mean starting with big money. Becky had gotten to understand this. Can I say about 5,000 shillings? <laughs> because um, I, I, I was sourcing uh, materials uh, as per the orders that I was getting. I have never, I never at any time went and got like a bulk, hundred of pieces of material. So uh, the first, the first like 10 um, fleece blankets that I made cost me about, because now at that point I was asking my mother-in-law, please stitch for me and she would stitch for me. So I wasn't paying her for labor. Um, she would just stitch, she would bring and I would, whatever. And I, I hadn't gotten to the point where I would put logos and whatever. So it was really, really on the downside. I would say 5,000 shillings, yes. And how does she get her product out there? I have a Facebook page, um, Indigo 6 Kenya, if you look it up. And I also have a website. Um, so my Facebook page, the website, and referrals. And where do you get to source your raw materials from? Okay, the shukas, I have actually been sourcing them from River Road. But I'm hoping that uh, since the quantities have grown, the company has grown, that I'll be able to source from the factory, which is in Ruiru. Um, for the fleeces, I started with sourcing from River Road, but it was very expensive because I would buy from a retail shop. So I have started to import from India and China because then I get the, a, a bigger variety in terms of color. From employment into your own business, yes. how was that transition? And how did you get to handle it? I think it helps that I have always wanted to be my own employer. Um, it's not been very long. I mean, I've just started like being on a full-time employment for me um, in Indigo. I like it because I am able to put in a lot of hours. What challenges have you faced so far and how do you get to handle them? I have faced quite a few challenges, I must say. Um, people who buy my fleeces and then take pictures and market them as their own products. I have had that quite a few. I mean, I have had such in incidences of uh, people fronting my product as their own product. I have also had a challenge with getting good workers, people who um, respect the job and take it as a, you know, like um, a, a job that's going to bring an income. So before I got the tailors that I have, I have had quite a challenge with finding people who can actually do quality work, especially when you have, you have completed a job and you are asked to undo it and do it again because it has not been done satisfactorily. So that has been a challenge. I have lost many workers because they, they want to finish other than just do a complete job. Um, I have had clients who are stuck on certain, you know, you want a green fleece, you want a certain green, which may not be available, or you want it matched with a plain Maasai shuka. There are no plain Maasai shukas. So just talking to the clients and getting them to understand that some of these things, I have, these are the colors that I have and I would best like them to work like this. Those have really been my challenges. Um, but the biggest one is that one of people fronting my product as their product. Becky's fleece blankets have gone far and wide. The Oprah blanket. Um, Caroline, who I say is actually the reason why Indigo is existing, called me up one afternoon and told me that I needed to make some three blankets that were very special. And I asked her, okay, who are they for? And she told me, um, somebody was going on a show, Live Your Best Life on Oprah, and she wanted to take a blanket to Oprah. Um, Stedman, who's Oprah's partner, and her friend Gail. So she told me to just, um, what I like about Caroline is, yes, she orders a lot of blankets from me, but she also trusts that I will get the colors and everything right. So I researched a bit on Oprah, what her colors are, what she likes, and I did some blankets which uh, Caroline's friend, Vicky Kaigai, is the one who was going on the show, took and she got to be able to, I mean, the fleeces actually 
got to Oprah while on the show and she wore them and took a photo with them. She was very, very impressed. I want you to give advice to somebody watching you who is probably in employment and is thinking about getting into entrepreneurship. What can you tell them? Um, I would tell them to think through because uh, you do need to have a plan on how to meet your monthly expenses. The reason why I stuck in a job is because of uh, I, I do have running expenses that definitely do me, need to still be met. So I needed to think through that. You need to think about the sustainability of the of whatever business you're going into. You as Becky, what motivates you? What keeps you going every day? My daughter, Latifa, because um, I'd like her to have a good sound education. Uh, so for me, I'd like her to have much more than I had. So every day when I wake up and I look at her and I know uh, this girl needs to achieve certain things that possibly I wasn't, I wasn't able to achieve. Again, I don't want to turn into that parent who lives their dream through their child. So I just want to have the best for her. I, she motivates me uh, to just keep pushing myself to have a better life. What do you love doing you know, at your free time when you're out of work and your hobbies too? Uh, when I'm out of work, we like, I, my husband likes to drive around, so we drive around aimlessly a lot just to see what's going on, what's happening, the assets that are coming up. Uh, we like to travel, we don't have that much time to travel because we are tied up in jobs that give you a certain number of days, per, uh, I mean per year of leave, so you have to plan very carefully. But um, even just sitting at home and watching a movie or just being with family, that is really us. We hardly go out or go out for a, for a meal, but not um, out to, to the club. Not, not much. We do go out, but very, very occasionally. Just sitting at home is good for my free time. If you have any comments on tonight's entrepreneur, leave a comment on our Facebook page, KTN The Entrepreneur, or reach us on our Twitter handle, KTN The Entrepreneur.